Good morning. My name is Sam. I am an alcoholic, and I'm also a son of recovery. Let's start out with the serenity prayer. Good and gracious God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Amen. I've been reading through the AA Big Book, and I'm in the personal uh, story section. Today's personal story is titled, Physician, Heal Thyself. Psychiatrist and surgeon, he had lost his way until he realized that God, not he, was the great healer. I am a physician, licensed to practice in a Western state. I am also an alcoholic. In two ways, I may be a little different from other alcoholics. First, we all hear at AA meetings that those who have lost everything, those who have been in jail, those who have been in prison, those who have lost their families, those who have lost their income, I've never lost any of it. I never was an old skid row. I made more money in the last year of my drinking than I made in my whole life. My wife never hinted that she would leave me. Everything that I touched from grammar school on was successful. I was president of my grammar school student body. I was president of all of my classes in high school, and in my last year, I was president of that student body. I was president of each class in the university and president of that student body. I was voted the man most likely to succeed. The same thing occurred in medical school. I belong to more medical societies and honor societies than men 10 to 20 years my senior. Mine was a skid row of success. The physical skid row in any city is miserable. The skid row of success is just as miserable. The second way in which, perhaps, I differ from some other alcoholics is this. Many alcoholics state that they don't particularly like the state of alcohol, but that they liked the effect. Sorry, many alcohols state that they don't particularly like the taste of alcohol and that they liked the effect. I loved alcohol. I used to like to get it on my fingers so I could lick them and get another taste. I had a lot of fun drinking. I enjoyed it immensely. And then, one ill-defined day, one day that I can't recall, stepped across the line that alcoholics know so well. From that day on, drinking was miserable. When a few drinks made me feel good before I went over that line, those same drinks now made me wretched. In an attempt to get over that feeling, there was a quick onslaught of a great number of drinks, and then all was lost. Alcohol failed to serve the purpose. On the last day I was drinking, I went up to see a friend who had had a good deal of trouble with alcohol, and whose wife had left him a number of times. He had come back, however, and he was on this program. In my stupid way, I went up to see him with the idea in the back of my mind that I would investigate Alcoholics Anonymous from a medical standpoint. Deep in my heart, was a feeling that maybe I could get some help here. This friend gave me a pamphlet, and I took it home and had my wife read it to me. There were two sentences in it that struck me. One said, don't feel that you are a martyr because you stopped drinking. And this hit me between the eyes. The second one said, don't feel that you stopped drinking for anyone other than yourself. And this hit me between the eyes. After my wife had read this to me, I said to her, as I had said many times in desperation, I have got to do something. She's a good-natured soul and said, I wouldn't worry about it. Probably something will happen. And then we went up, we went up the side of a hill where we, where we have a little barbecue area to make the fire for the barbecue. And on the way up, I thought to myself, I'll go back down to the kitchen and refill this drink. And just then, something did happen. The thought came to me. This is the last one. It was well into the second fifth by this time. And as that thought came to me, it was as though someone had reached down and taken a heavy overcoat off my shoulders, for that was the last one. About two days later, I was called by a friend of mine from Nevada City. He's a brother of my wife's closest friend. He said, Earl. I said, yes. He said, I'm an alcoholic. What do I do? And I gave him some idea of what you do. And so I made my first 12-step call before I ever came into the program. The satisfaction I got from giving him a little of what I had read in those pamphlets far surpassed any feeling that I had ever had before in helping patients. So I decided that I would go to my first meeting. I was introduced as a psychiatrist. I belong to the American Psychiatric Society, but I don't practice psychiatry as much. I am a surgeon. As someone in AA said to me once upon a time, there is nothing worse than a confused psychiatrist. I will never forget the first meeting that I attended. There were five people present, including me. At one end of the table sat our community butcher. At the other side of the table sat one of the carpenters in our community. And at the farther end of the table sat the man who ran the bakery, while on one side sat my friend who was a mechanic. I recall, as I walked into that meeting, saying to myself, here I am, 
a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, a fellow of the International College of Surgeons, a diplomat of one of the great specialty boards in these United States, a member of the American Psychiatric Society. And I have to go to the butcher, the baker, and the carpenter to help make a man out of me. Something else happened to me. This was such a new thought that I got all sorts of books on higher powers. And I put a Bible by my bedside. And I put a Bible in my car. It is still there. And I put a Bible in my locker at the hospital. And I put a Bible in my desk. And I put a big book by my nightstand. And I put a 12 Steps and 12 Traditions in my locker at the hospital. And I got books by Emmett Fox. And I got books by God knows who. And I got to reading all these things. And the first thing you know, I was... And the first thing you know, I was lifted right out of the AA group, and I floated higher and higher and even higher to was way up on a pink cloud, which is known as Pink 7, and I felt miserable again. So I thought to myself, I might just go as well be drunk as I feel like this. <clears throat> I went to Clark, the community butcher, and I said, Clark, what is the matter with me? I don't feel right. I've been on this program for three months, and I feel terrible. And he said, Earl, why don't you come on over and let me talk to you for a minute? So he got me a cup of coffee and a piece of cake and sat me down and said, Why? There's nothing wrong with you. You've been sober for three months. Been working hard. You've been working all, You've been doing all right. But then he said, Let me say something to you. We have here in this community an organization that helps people. And this organization is known as Alcoholics Anonymous. Why don't you join it? I said, What do you think I've been doing? Well, he said, You've been sober. But you've been floating, floating way up on a cloud somewhere. Why don't you go home and get the big book and open it at page 58 and see what it says? So I did. I got the big book, and I read it. And this is what it said. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. The word thoroughly rang a bell. And then it went on to say, Half measures avail us, availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. And the last sentence was, We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Complete abandon. Half measures availed us nothing, thoroughly followed our path, completely gave themselves to the simple program, rang in my swelled head. Years earlier, I'd gone into psychoanalysis to get relief. I spent five and a half years in psychoanalysis and proceeded to become a drunk. I don't mean that in any sense as a derogatory statement about psychotherapy. It's a very great tool, not too potent, but a great tool. I would do it again. I tried every gimmick that there was to get some peace of mind. But it was not until I was brought to my alcoholic knees, when I was brought to a group in my own community with the butcher, the baker, the carpenter, and the mechanic, who were able to give me the 12 steps, that I was finally given some semblance of an answer to the last half of the first step. So, after taking the first half of the first step, and very gingerly admitting myself to Alcoholics Anonymous, something happened. And then I thought to myself, imagine an alcoholic admitting anything but I made my admission just the same. The third step said, make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Now they asked us to make a decision. We've got to turn the whole business over to some joker we can't even see. And this chokes the alcoholic. Here, he is powerless, unmanageable, in the grip of something bigger than he is, and he's got to turn the whole business over to someone else. It fills the alcoholic with rage. We are great people. We can handle anything. And so one gets to thinking to oneself, who is this God? Who is this fellow we are supposed to turn everything over to? What can he do for us that we can't do for ourselves? Well, I don't know who he is, but I've got my own idea. For myself, I have an absolute proof of the existence of God. I was sitting in my office one time after I operated on a woman. It had been a long four or five hour operation, a large surgical procedure. She was on her ninth or tenth post-operative day. She was doing fine. She was up and around, and that day her husband phoned me and said, Doctor, thanks very much for curing my wife. And I thanked him for his felicitations, and he hung up. And then I scratched my head and said to myself, What a fantastic thing for a man to say that I cured his wife. Here I am down at my office behind my desk, and there she is out at the hospital. I'm not even there, and if I was there, the only thing I could do would be to give her moral support, and yet he thanks me for curing his wife. I thought to myself, what is curing that woman? Yes, I put in those stitches. The great boss has given me a diagnostic and surgical talent, and he has loaned it to me for use for the rest of my life. It doesn't belong to me. He has loaned it to me, and I did my job. But that, had, but that ended nine days ago. What healed those tissues that I closed? I didn't. 
This to me is the proof of the existence of a somethingness greater than I am. I couldn't practice medicine without the great physician. All I do in a very simple way is to help him cure my patients. Shortly after I was starting to work on the program, I realized that I was not a good father. I was not a good husband, but, oh, I was a good provider. I never robbed my family of anything. I gave them everything, except the greatest things in the world, and that is peace of mind. So I went to my wife and I asked her if there wasn't something that she and I could do to somehow get together. And she turned on her heel and looked me squarely in the eye and said, you don't care anything about my problem. And I could have smacked her, but I said to myself, grab onto your serenity. She left, and I sat down and crossed my hands and looked up and said, For God's sake, help me. And then a silly, simple thought came to me. I didn't know anything about being a father. I didn't know how to come home and work weekends like other husbands. I didn't know how to entertain my family. But I remembered that every night after dinner, my wife would get up and do the dishes. Well, I could do the dishes, so I went to her and said, There's one thing I want. There's only one thing I want in my whole life, and I don't want any commendation. I don't want any credit. I don't want anything from you or Jamie for the rest of your life, except one thing. And that is the opportunity to, opportunity to do anything you want always. And I would like to start off by doing the dishes. And now I'm doing the darn dishes every night. Doctors have been notoriously unsuccessful in helping alcoholics. They've contributed fantastic amounts of time and work to our problem. But they aren't able, it seems, to arrest either your alcoholism or mine. And the clergy have tried hard to help us, but we haven't been helped. And, so, and the psychiatrist has had thousands of couches and has put you and me on many of them many times, but he hasn't helped us very much. Though, he's tried hard, and we owe the clergy and the doctor and the psychiatrist a deep debt of gratitude. But they haven't helped our alcoholism, except in a rare few instances. But Alcoholics Anonymous has helped. What is this power that AA possesses, this curative power? I don't know what it is. I suppose the doctor might say, this is a psychosomatic medicine. I suppose the psychiatrist might say, this is a benevolent interpersonal relations. I suppose other, others would say, this is, this is group psychotherapy. To me, it is God. That is the truth. To me, it is God. It is the higher power. I love his realization of how he is merely borrowing the skills that his higher power has given him for his life, and then he will be giving them back or passing them on to other people as he lives. But he's only here to use those tools <clears throat> and to do something with those tools until he can, because it doesn't belong to me, he has said. He has loaned it to me, and I did my job, but that ended nine days ago. The real healing is in the somethingness that is greater than I am. That is the truth. Again, we have a story of a man who did not lose everything and really didn't lose anything except uh, his peace of mind. And then realizing how unmanageable his life was, even though he was providing everything for his family, he fully admitted how he then realized he wasn't a good father or a good husband, and I was not a good partner or a good brother or a good son or a good co-worker or a good any of that while I was drinking. I was pretty terrible. Uh, and it really was lightning for me when I walked in that room. Uh, I fortunately... I don't remember having much of a pink cloud that I walked on. We'd have to ask my sponsor and a couple of my friends, but I don't remember much of one. Uh, I do remember the pure joy of feeling amazing, but I had a slew of work I had to get done in a year for my probation. Um, so I was constantly going to the court uh, at least once a month. I was constantly fulfilling things on my probation list with my probation officer. I was going to court. I was getting tickets taken care of and paperwork done uh, and meeting all of the, and having the breathalyzer on my car for six months and meeting all of those requirements. So that's one thing I think about is a reason I might not have had a pink cloud, uh, that joy and then all of a sudden falling down to what's going on right now that many alcoholics suddenly feel after three months of getting sober. Uh, 
I think I didn't feel that because I had so many things I had to get done. Uh, and so the opportunity of not having problems, of everything going so well for a while, wasn't really there because I was still digging, still filling my hole back in and getting out of it. Uh, yeah. But a lot of, uh, I've heard stories of alcoholics who've really felt that way. After three months, all of a sudden, they're like, a problem may come up or they may realize something and it's hard to deal with. And so that pink cloud that they are on is suddenly popping and the exhilaration uh, is suddenly falling away because they're realizing life is still moving forward and still happening and things still happen in life. Just because you get sober doesn't mean everything suddenly disappears. Problems are still there. It's just how we deal with them. Uh, and that's the moment when alcoholics can realize the community that we have built because that is the thing. When he, here at the end, is asking, what is the power that AA possesses? The curative power. It is our higher power, and it is the community of people, and the honesty and support and the love that we get uh, in those rooms. I'm going to leave you there. Uh, please leave any thoughts, questions, or comments, and blessings, and peace, love, and coffee.